This episode of The Minimalist is brought to you by nobody, because advertisements suck. The Minimalists. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to The Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus, and together we are the Minimalists. We're here with our returning champion, Rob Bell, is yeah. in the studio. <laughs> this is his victory lap. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, there were earlier laps. <laughs> you were our first ever guest on on The Minimalist. Before then, I think yeah. we did like 100 episodes alone, and then mm. we did a, a um, live event with you in Los Angeles, and we yeah. put that up, and you were that was the. Our, the first guest on on the minimalist seriously yeah, yeah. and now you're and the, the last and guest. I, I was just gonna make oh. that joke <laughs> anyway oh, we're here on the occasion <laughs> of rob's new book everything is spiritual yeah. rob let me just say this this is the book i was hoping you would write oh wow i just gotta take that in for a minute that's good you know it's uh i mean i've, I've read Past books, really, really enjoy, you know, uh, How to Be Here, Velvet Elvis, Loved Ones, etc. But but this book in particular, it feels in many ways like, well, it couldn't have happened until now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And while it's a history, it's also looking forward at the same time. Yeah. Well done there. Yeah, that's all baked into it. Uh huh. Let's talk a bit about this book. What, why now? You have to own every square inch of your story. Mm. Mm. Otherwise, you have all these like bits and pieces y you don't know what to do with. Mm. The embarrassing stuff, the awkward stuff, the heartbreaking stuff, the stuff that's like locked in a black box at the bottom of the ocean. Mm. Um, but everything is spiritual. Like spirit is in all of it. And when mm. you look back on your life, the awkward, embarrassing, heartbreaking, tragic stuff is often where the new life came. Yeah. Mm. Like you crashed, you hit the wall, you ended up face down, you know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then you look back and you're like, oh wait, in that grief and pain were all these seeds of imagination of a new life. Yeah. So there are all these categories that most people live enslaved to, good, bad, right, wrong, winning, losing, success, failure, these binaries, these dualities. And yet there's something lurking in all of it. There's something under it, through it. There's like an, like an electricity, like a charge, like, mm. I mean, in the ancient tradition, spirit. And that's where the new creation comes. You don't avoid, you don't try to get rid of your anxiety. You listen to it because mm. it's telling you something about who you are and what's off. Uh, it's a restlessness that there could be more. Yeah. So in some senses, that's why now as you get to a point where you realize it was all okay <laughs> and it wasn't just okay it's like a to be here is like a wondrous glorious experience yeah and cyn we tried cynicism you know what i mean a bunch of people moved to brooklyn you know what i mean <laughs> rolled their eyes we tried all that you know what i'm saying we tried cynicism yeah yeah didn't work yeah standing at a distance pointing out everything that's wrong with everything some people still need to like try that out for themselves. We gave like. that a good <laughs> shot, but innocence, wonder, awe, the sense that you're wide-eyed and you're here mm. and we're doing this, that's where it's at. So yeah, that's why now. Mm. But there's a line <laughs> in the book that, that stood out to me. There's quite a few that I have underlined, but this one uh, I wrote down. My understanding of God was suddenly shifting. Something less out there and more right here, right now. Um, how has your, your faith evolved? A lot of people will know your backstory. So some people won't. We could cover it briefly. But um, how has your, your faith evolved? Because Ryan and I have two different belief systems. I think we have the same values, but, but we, we, we believe something different. But I think those beliefs are, are ever evolving as, as we learn, as we go through some of those crashes yeah. as well. Yeah. How do you feel mm. like uh, you've evolved since, say, oh. 98 or <laughs> 2011? In what ways? Well, is the book 300 pages? So there's a start <laughs> to the answer. Yeah. Um, from, from when I was a kid, I remember having this sense that there's more going on here. This thing came, the universe is not a cold, dead place. Mm. The, it was even the earth. 
I tell these stories about soil and water and trees and rocks, like some sense that this thing is alive or it's humming or something. Um, and that's really important because for so many people, their intuitive understanding of the nature of this thing, um, they were right on. Like how many people, for how many people religion actually jacked up their understanding. It gave them a bunch of things that weren't helpful, but they mm. intuitively the whole time had a sense like we're all connected. This thing does matter. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. there, I'm here for some reason, if that's even the word you'd use for it. So uh, I had that sense at a young age and sort of followed it. And in the world I came from, well, that that's religion. And then I was like, I, I love talk. I want to help people like with these mysteries. So then that became like, go be a pastor, study. I got a, a master's degree in divinity, a master's <laughs> in divinity. Let's pause for the absurdity of that. <laughs> a master of divinity. The deep the mysteries. That's you see great. what I'm saying? All right, you are. Like if you don't see the absurdity <laughs> baked into that, Dude, um, we should do attention. masters in minimalism. So it's like I followed those. I, I, because I, our tribes they give us like a path. Like this is how you mm. do it. Um, and every group, tribe, family system has like its ladder. Climb this way. But uh, it was always like that wasn't. Uh, it was always the thing in here that was like, it's mm. good. It's good to be here. Keep going. Keep following it. Yeah. So sort of just keep following it. Everything is spiritual. I mean, the, the title comes from a talk you gave a few years ago, right? Yeah. And um, when, when someone sees that title, they're going to start getting all kinds of conceptions in their mind, right? Um, what, why, why choose this title? Because there are other titles you could have used to describe the same exact book. Yeah, yeah. Cause the first Everything is Spiritual tour was in 2006. And it was about quantum physics and mysticism and dimensional theory all the sort of what is the like what we know from science about the world is what is <laughs> we're in a ball a rock hurtling through space at sixty-seven thousand miles an hour um and then the second tour was in 2015 which expanded on this and talked about this evolving universe that never stops expanding it's omnicentric every place in the universe is actually the center of the universe because it never stops expanding so i was I had some ideas about the third one, which would be just more like mind-blowing ideas about mm. science and spirit and what's happening here and what this, what we know about this experience we're having. But I kept coming back to they're just ideas. Mm. Where did, how did I come to these ideas? You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. it's easy to be stuck in your head. And, and just minds talking to minds. You have information, you have information. I say this, you say this, we just trade. But there's like, what shaped our souls? Um, what were those experiences? And I found myself like, wait, how did I come to see the world the way that I do? Um, what, what shaped me? And it was the strangest thing, because suddenly I was like, oh, my grandma used to keep cash in her bra, which is the first line of the book. Yeah, And I'm suddenly I'm back on the porch with my grandma because we would sit out on her farm on the porch and the wind would blow across the tops of the field, across the corn in the fields. And sometimes we would just sit for a while in silence. And I realized that was my first experience of the wordlessness of grace. When the presence of another person communicates to you that everything's fine, even if it isn't. Mm. And I remember just, I burst out like in tears, like, Oh, sitting on the porch with my grandma, like that did something to me. And then suddenly that became what was interesting. So I just followed it into my, the generations before me. Um, yeah, so then it became, oh, that's the new, because those tours had giant whiteboards that I would fill in. Right. We could, oh, we're the whiteboard. Mm. Like you, Joshua, you, Ryan, like that's the greatest mystery. That's as mysterious. Your interiors are as fascinating as the exteriors of the solar system. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it became, could I write a book that captured what it's been like to be me in such a way that it was holding a mirror up to you mm. Mm. and what it's like to be you? Because the universal is found in the particulars. So you go far enough into the aches and pains and details of your life, that's how we all will mm. find ourselves. 
Yeah, so that's what happened. Yeah, it was unbelievable to write it. You know, the first time I met you, <clears throat> I remember telling you how you helped me hold place for God, essentially. And I was so on the fence of like having, you even talk about in your book with the woman and her husband who committed suicide, that God, yeah. having that death of the God that you believed yeah, in. Some gods die. Yeah. And that happened to me and I had no idea where to go. And yeah. um, you really helped me hold space for at least possibilities. But I bring that up because you did a masterful job of doing this with spirituality. It's like, uh, I'll use the word energy sometimes, all oh, the energy in the room or like the energy of a city. And every time I say it, I cringe a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm like, you have a woo woo reflex. Yeah, exactly. There's a yeah. little woo woo reflex. And I'm like, I don't know another word for it, but I'm just feeling something right now. But it's, and it's real. It is real. And I think now I can look at it as uh, spirituality in a way, that energy. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is the great quandary of the modern world is as soon as you had the birth of scientific materialism, which is we can measure this world, we can go in a lab and study it which was incredibly important because we have microphones and airports and hospitals and like the modern world was built on this rigorous rationality. But the underside of that was it tended to value things that could be empirically measured, things you can access with your five senses, things you can hold in your hand. Mm -hmm. And so realities of life that can't be accessed in those ways inevitably diminished soul, mm -hmm. spirit. Even this phrase people use like woo woo, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, yeah, but for thousands of years, that's just as real. Mm. So something can have form like this cup, um, but something can have zero physical form and be just as real, an idea, mm -hmm. love, mm -hmm. hope. Um, so in some senses, we're like children of a system that so heavily prized one dimension of the human experience, the exterior objective, and that you can like win that game now in the modern world and know next to nothing about interior subjective. Mm -hmm. What's it like to be Ryan? Mm. Aches, desires, yeah. So spirituality has always been the naming of that because mm. it's just as real. Mm. And you can see people rediscovering this because you have to essentially. With the, the rediscovering thing is fascinating because I, as soon as I read this, there were all kinds of people I thought were the appropriate audience for this, but I found <laughs> them like all over the place. Like it wasn't a particular demographic, mm. right? It, it was like, oh, I know this guy or gal who yeah. has, it, there's always this pendulum that swings, right? It's like, yeah, and you talk about this a little bit in the book where, where you go from, you know, uber religious to uber atheist or you know hedonistic to to ascetic right and and it leaves very room very little room for the giant spectrum in between yeah. these two poles but to me th this book is like it's the room in between which is where all the interesting stuff is yeah like the pe people will tell you a story like and then i like was was talking to them and I mean we found all this common ground and I mean I'm a whatever and they're from whatever and then they refer like they're shocked because they walked into the situation with these labels about they're this and this person's this but then I mean we found out we have all this stuff in common it's like yeah so how about next time just start there mm. yeah we're humans well, we do have some yeah. questions about labels. We've got some other questions and this is an audience driven show so I should probably dive into some of these questions here We've got one from Kat in Savannah, Georgia. I was just wondering if you guys tend to use the law of attraction to help manifest minimalism and or any sort of success or whatever it is that you want in your lives and how that has been for you. Rob, when I hear Kat's question, why do I, I, I tense up when I hear two things. I hear law of attraction and all of a sudden, I, and it, it's my own uh, negative response. It's the woo-woo radar. It's the woo-woo it, alarm. There's something there, but then also the word manifest. Like It's another woo-woo alarm bell for you. It, for whatever <laughs> reason, it is, it's nails on a chalkboard for me, and it shouldn't be, and I should be more open-minded to things like this. Um, because I, w when I hear it, I almost don't even know what it means. <laughs> Notice, is that a question? <laughs> It's more of a Rob, rant. Thoughts? Was there a question <laughs> at the end 
of that sentence. <laughs> yeah. Wh- wh- what? Uh, why do I have this allergy? There we go. Allergic to woo wooiness. Uh, my guess is you have a instinctual reflex against something that seems to take this vast, mysterious, extraordinarily generative universe and boil it down to one law. Mm. Mm. It actually feels to you too minimalism. Too simplistic. Mm. So the impulse in the question is wonderful. How you think about things profoundly shapes what they even are. Mm. So that's why her, her question is so powerful is she has come into a way of understanding the power of how you choose to name the experience because that shapes what the experience even is. Mm. Um, mm. So an example would be uh, recently I was talking to this guy who said to me, and he was, he was lovely. He was talking about his own life and he now has a daughter and he's married and he's exploring how he's going to live. He's a young um, businessman and he said, you know, every generation uh, wants to one up the generation before it. Mm. I was like, okay, first off, totally understand the impulse, but let me say that word back to you and tell me how your body hears that word, one up. He's like, oh, tense. It's like, yeah, one up is what? And he said, uh, competition. Mm. I said, fall that, competition meaning what? And he's like, oh, win or lose. Mm. Oh, and then you evaluate yourself whether you won or lose. So that phrase sounds wonderful. Each generation wants to one up the one before it, but what it actually, the experience of it is a tense experience of scarcity. Mm-hmm. Mm. So there's all of these energies hidden in a <laughs> statement like that that can just fly right under the radar like, oh yeah, every generation, um, so the, the power of thinking about how you think about the world is it alerts you to all the ways that you're actually framing your experience in ways that aren't going to take you anywhere you want to go. Mm. Yeah, the, the, the language is, is so powerful. Yeah. I mean, you can improve upon that. You could even use the word improve upon. You could say uh, each generation wants to improve upon the p- previous and all of a sudden you've... Give you've, more. There you go. Hand less to unlearn. Yeah. Yeah, mm. wonderful impulses. So... Underneath the question, let's go back to why you threw up in your mouth at the question. (laughs) The truth is there are these extraordinarily subtle shifts in how we view everything. So one example was you can view life through a lens of scarcity and lack, or you can view life through a lens of abundance and generativity, generosity. Mm. And these are, they exist almost so deep in the self that you can't even see them. You know what I mean? They're so close in here, but they're actually what you look through. Uh, The gift of something like law of attraction, it simply alerts people to, if I am operating from a place of scarcity and lack, then I'm going to see everything as competition. The goodness that comes to others will always be a threat to me, which leads to jealousy and envy. And it ultimately shrinks heart and soul. If I see the earth and this world we're living in is abundant and can provide for all, and I'm going to be fine, that's going to profoundly shape things. How's that? Yeah. A great Look story. at you. He's twitching less. <laughs> oh. Well, I do think about the language uh, with, yeah. with my daughter in particular. So uh, you know, our, our, the way we end every episode is love people use things because the opposite never works. And, and the problem is we often say we love something like, I love Ryan, but oh man, I love these chairs, right? And same word for chairs mm-hmm. and Ryan, mm-hmm. right? And we have a language problem, really, right? <laughs> and and uh, never knew chairs could be that awesome. And <laughs> Ella always argues with me. She's like, "But I, I love my robe," and I'm like, "And it, well, it made me realize, like, oh, like this is what children do." is they love things and they get confused with you know with the mm. things that they love and, and and it's misplaced priorities and all these other things it's because they're children they don't have a fully developed prefrontal cortex and and but we as adults don't we do the same thing mm. i still say i love this chair and I, mm. I i get attached to to these things i give meaning to things that don't deserve that meaning yeah. right well it's interesting because you know if i say i love you versus I love that chair. Uh-huh. It's two completely different emotions. Right. And and it's interesting how, I mean, this goes back to the language thing. If you're looking at just the language, the law of attraction sounds really silly. But like when I think of the law of attraction, it's it's very emotional for me. Like it's not like, oh, 
if I think I'm going to make a million dollars, it's going to drop on my lap. It's more like, uh, what would I do with that? Why do I want a million dollars? What am I going to do with that? Oh, what I really want to do is I want to be financially free. I want to be able to give to others. So then I start to focus on that, which leads to actions to do that, which really, even in the movie, what is it called? The secret, Mm -hmm. the law of attraction movie. I mean, every single one of those people who they interviewed, there was so much action that went behind their law of attraction. But that, like, I feel that though, when I hear the law of attraction, it's like, I feel the action that comes along with it. So yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, you and I kind of disagree on that. The love thing. Um, I agree with you and I try to use it that way that we talk about. Mm -hmm. Um, but if someone says it, like I don't let it interrupt their moment that they're experiencing, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Cut Ellis some slack, man. (laughs) (laughs) Cat, I'm going to send you a copy of Everything is Spiritual, uh, Rob Bell's new book. It just came out today, by the way, if you're listening to this the the day that this episode came out. We have another question from Luis in Sao Paulo, Brazil. How do you guys relate religion to the lifestyle of minimalism? Well, Rob, when Ryan and I talk about minimalism, we're talking about minimalism as a lifestyle in particular. I mean, there are other forms of minimalism, obviously. We're not talking about... Donald Judd or, or Brad Easton Ellis and Lori Moore. Um, it, when we talk about minimalism as a lifestyle, it's you know, living a meaningful life with less, trying to figure out the things that truly add value to our life, getting rid of that which is superfluous to make room for that which is important. And so how do you, how do you relate that to religion or spirituality? Well, historically, if you think about the word religion, in the middle is this L-I-G. It comes from the Latin. The Latin is this word root. Is this L-I-G is this word legare, which means to bind or connect. Mm. So, so that's where ligament comes mm. from because it binds these two things together. So if you think about the etymology, like the structure of the word religion, uh, religion is what holds you together. So that, that's its intent. Otherwise, life pulls you in a hundred different directions. You like disintegrate. So religion was always, what are the practices or rituals? What are the things you do that hold you together? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what you all have been doing with this message of minimalism is very religious at its core. Mm. You're inviting people to be held together by something other than unthinking, uncritical consumerism. Just mm. the accumulation. There's more to life than the accumulation of dead objects. Mm. Um, so when people talk about religion as a bad thing, but then they say, but my friend, they do that religiously. Yeah, they do that on a regular basis because it helps give coherence and holds them together. Now, the problem in modern culture for many people is religion did the opposite. It actually split things apart. It mm. created tribes, not community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it like collapsed in on itself for many people. That was their experience. Mm. which is fine, but it doesn't mean that we won't just find other things to be religious about. Mm. Um, so the person's like, I walk my dog every morning, I take a jog, training for it. Yeah, of course you do. Yeah, I have, I have a do- meal with my kid every day. Yeah, of course you do. There are these things that you do that hold you together. They bind you, bind you to a sense of larger purpose, meaning, divinity, um, mm. bind you to other people. Yeah, yeah, so what you all do is actually very religious. Huh. Wow, you've like you didn't a, see that coming. No, though. you made me you made me feel good about it. You, well, because you know it's yes. interesting is like when we first started this, people were like, "What are you doing? Starting a cult?" And I was like, "No, not a cult," because because cult leads itself, to, you know, because once a cult gets big enough, it becomes religion. <laughs> but uh, but you know, I actually really like what we do because there's no dogmatics to it in religion in the sense that you talked about. I can actually own that. And be like, yeah, yeah, I, I totally, there, there is a religious thing going on as far as looking at something greater than what's in front of us. And Absolutely. This and, is, and it wasn't just. Well, you think about it, in terms of, religion for many people was a head game. Mm. What do you believe? Like you said, no dogma. What do you believe? Mm-hmm. How, how is your, mental furniture arranged? Mm-hmm. That mm. became. But historically, religion was always a path. Like, how do you live? Yeah. Like, it was economic. It was political. It, it was a way of ordering your life and ordering the world. Like, in the Bible, over and over again, the Bible is about how does the world get ordered? 
um, if there's a widening gap between rich and poor, that's destructive for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't live with the earth in the earth in a sustainable way, everything falls apart. So the question is, how does the world get ordered? And in some senses, what you've done is create a space that raises questions for people about how do you order your world? Mm. Because there are ways of ordering the world that just lead to despair and a sense of empty what is going on here. And there are ways that lead you to community and love and connection and all that. You guys are way more religious than you realize. That <laughs> is a great tagline. Minimalism. <laughs> The, way philo the philosophy on how to order your world. <laughs> oh, I was thinking you were going to say minimalism. We are way more religious. We are way <laughs> than <you> think. <laughs> that's uh, that's number two. Tag well, this is from uh, the criticism <laughs> section on the minimalist Wikipedia page. Um, so there are a few things in here about religion. According to the Dallas Morning News, more than a few have ascribed religious underpinnings to the minimalist work, but Milburn insists the minimalists are not a faith-based <laughs> business. <laughs> And we don't believe in the law of attraction. Uh, right, here, here's one that Rob will appreciate. In an article titled, Your Minimalist Lifestyle is Quasi-Religious Anti-Poor Bullshit, Vice Magazine condemned the minimalist as, quote, glowing examples of as asceticism as solution, mm. ascribing deeply religious motives to their movement because they are, quote, a pair of white dudes who travel the world to proclaim the joys of simplicity and just happened to be close friends with evangelical legend Rob Bell. <laughs> <laughs> just so happened. He's wait, been wait, on wait, our you're this? Yeah. Yeah. This is, this I was is, like, what is he, where is this coming no, from? No, this is an article <laughs> that was written about us. Uh, the article goes on to claim, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, I guess what Rob's saying is, yeah, we, the vice is right. <laughs> yeah. Damn, we didn't even know it. They knew it before we knew it. <laughs> pretty, much, pretty much every wisdom tradition had in it some space for uh i was gonna say denial but that's not the right word for living i would call it closer to the earth you you generally find these polarities of feasting and fasting mm -hmm. sometimes what is needed is a, a celebration of the abundance of life mm -hmm. a big table with lots of food and everybody comes to it yeah mm -hmm. sometimes sometimes you need to feast. Yeah. Uh, but other times, fasting, which would be simply going without, is how you realign, how you awaken. Um, and so you can see anytime somebody parks themselves at one of those two, you've missed that sometimes it's time for feasting mm. and sometimes it's time for fasting. Mm. So, so the aesthetic, the one who withdraws or the one who intentionally goes with less or without that's always been one of the ways that people found their soul lived with integrity realigned recentered experienced rebirth mm. uh, so it's funny when the aesthetic is spoken of a of derisively mm -hmm. because that's like a thousand year old human pattern of one of the ways that people have helped check themselves and realign themselves <laughs> you know what i mean yeah <laughs> it's just fascinating to see it seen as like sort of trivial or something when yeah. the witness of like the cloud of witnesses across history has been yeah sometimes you need to go live in a cave for a bit sometimes you need to yeah. give away your stuff that's well, that's all part of the thing i think any new idea or I mean, it, the, minimalism isn't a new idea, but maybe right. an, an old idea for a new... Any old for, idea that appears unfamiliar. Problem. Yeah. Well, it's a new it gets, problem, It gets right? criticized, so, yeah. So the, the, the problem now that we have, you know, especially around 2008, we had the, this whole collapse, is we, we realized for the first time, like, massive amounts of debt. We spend $1.2 trillion a year on non-essential goods uh, in the United States alone. And, and so you look at something like that and you realize, like, Oh, we're we're wasting our money, which we have to work a lot of time to get to buy things we don't want or need. We're going into debt. We have this huge problem with over indulgent overconsumption. And I think around the crash, it was a reset. It was a crash for people to realize like, oh, may maybe the way that we're living is is wrong. Mm -hmm. Some people made some changes around the time Ryan and I um we we stumbled across this whole minimalism thing. But then over the last decade, I think we faced a new problem with social media and, and 24 hour news cycles every minute of every day. Now we're facing this 
over we're overly distracted as well. Mm -hmm. So not only are we over over consuming stuff, but we're over consuming discrete inputs and you know we're, we're, we're being bombarded with hundreds of thousands of discrete inputs every single day and what we're saying is you don't have to be an ascetic and go live in a cave but maybe you can look at what the, at what their recipe is and tweeze out a few ingredients and see what's appropriate for your own life mm. yeah yeah maybe like one day a week you don't check your email and for many people, that creates a low-grade panic. Mm -hmm. yeah. But 20 years ago, you didn't ha have email. So a thing that you didn't have, like think about that feeling when you misplaced your phone mm -hmm. and just what that sends like neurochemically through your body, the agitation level of a thing that you didn't used to know existed, yeah. like a tiny little machine that you carry in your pocket. You now, if you misplace it, my whole life is on that phone. Yeah. You start going through the five yeah, so this stages is brand oh, new. immediately. Yeah. This is brand new. Humans haven't ever had this sort of experience that we're having with these machines. Mm. Makes me think about how you, brand new. you talk about the molecules being brand new and the atoms being brand yes. new at a certain point. And uh, yeah, where's technology going to take us? It's, yes. yeah, it's like we're in it right now. We're in the brand new right now. Yes. <laughs> yes. And we're just now learning. Like you think about how the algorithms in social media are bent towards the outrageous. Yeah. So this person comments, hey, I really enjoyed that. The algorithm's like, whatever. This person's like, you suck. <laughs> heat, heat center, <laughs> throbbing heat center. You know what I mean? And then this person piles on. I mean, the machines are literally tilted towards the outrageous. Mm. I mean, if you, if you understood that, you could become president. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> that the machines are bent in a particular direction. So every person who's like, how did 2016 happen? Much better question. How aware are you of your role in that? Because mm. every time you click something outrageous, yeah, you are reaffirming that the algorithms are bent in the proper direction. And yeah. that's the, the biggest problem with, with the advertising model. I, I appreciate that you don't do advertisements in your podcast. And um, uh, there are a few other people out there who don't. And, and the reason we don't is well, we want people to support us for the right reasons. You know, thank, thank you to our Patreon supporters who, who support us and keep us in this podcast space. But what, what I've realized with the advertising model is it's only about aggregating eyeballs because the more eyeballs that are on your newspaper or TV show or whatever it is, the more they can charge for advertising. And so they no longer need to add value to an audience. They simply need to aggregate or herd an audience to their platform. And in doing so, they make more revenue. Well, how do you do that? Well, you, you amp up the, the outrage. And then, of course, as you say, we are complicit in, in the clicking and the viewing yeah. and the not turning it off. Yeah. So, yeah, going back to spirituality, spirituality is a heightened awareness of what these forms that we have created are doing to us. Because spirit animates forms. Mm. So we are surrounded by these forms and these new forms are shaping us. Mm. So you can see people waking up to, wait, these machines and the algorithms are actually doing things to us and we have tremendous power to shape them, to resist, to mm. form neural pathways. There's always an empowerment of, they're doing this to us, but they don't have to. Yeah, we can set it down. We can not click all that. Mm. It's interesting. It makes me think. Like I look at, uh, like my dad right now, who's like very devout Jehovah's Witness. It's the it's evil in the world. It's this evil. You know, it's Satan and his demons, and they're affecting the world. And I have that also. That world died for me too. And the way I look at it now is perfect example is social media we look at it and we say oh man look at all the evil look at what satan's doing with the technology and all this influence but it's us <laughs> <laughs> who is doing it as my dad switches to fox news and then he goes to their website <laughs> and then he looks at all the bad going on he is becoming part of it and it's interesting because the way i look at evil now is like i can take responsibility for my own evil yeah instead of making it a spiritual thing and saying, oh, there's an entity that's making me do this. It's like, I can look right. at it and be like, that's actually coming from here. Right, you don't need to project your shadow onto some external character. Right. You could just own 
your part in it and yeah. take responsibility and grow up. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. then when lots of people do that, things change. Yeah. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It is time for our lightning round where we answer <laughs> questions. Well, from your from your text messages. You can text your questions and comments to 937 202 4654. Yes, indeed. Those uh, texts go to both of our phones because we're a little bit crazy. Um, <laughs> and we do respond to some people uh, from time to time, but we also re respond to your questions here on the podcast. Now, Rob, I don't wait, know if you. Wait, this is the lightning round? Yeah, I don't. Okay, I, know, I think I, I've been on this podcast twice. All yeah. I'm going to say is all of my memories are that your lightning rounds are longer <laughs> yes. than the regular round. Yeah, everything we do is steeped in irony. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I remember last time the lightning round was like, th this is not a lightning round. <laughs> this is like a take a walk around the lake round. Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. During a lightning storm, really. Yeah. It's a, it's a lightning <laughs> storm that, round. Uh, okay, right. good. So, Rob, I don't know if you remember, but what we try to do during the lightning round, and we fail every time, but we, um, we fail beautifully. Uh, we try to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. But in the real world, what we do is maunder on a bit until we get something that is tweetable. Mm -hmm. We've also had a couple of days of prep for this. So uh. <laughs> now, now Sean tweezes out our pithy phrases. He, we call them minimal maxims. He puts them in the show notes so the audience can copy and share our, our pithy answers on social media. Ryan, we got a question from Simba. Simba. Is Rob Bell still a Christian? <laughs> 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 Rob this thoughts. In characters. <laughs> I think he would say, "I wrote a 300-page book about that." To yeah. answer your question, and this literal question he answers in the book, which is great. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I I'll give you a pithy answer, and then maybe we can expand on it. Labels are useful, but not as powerful as everyday actions. Um, yeah. You know, doesn't it mean? Would you maybe answer that question with a question like, "What do you mean by Christian?" Two characters. Of course. <laughs> That's the pithiest <laughs> answer ever. <laughs> that is all. I, dude, you could tweet of course too, and like it would just like. <laughs> people would just like, <laughs> I needed that today. It, like, especially like when the, you know, the, awesome. the entire West Coast is on fire and Rob just tweets, of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Often what presents itself as religion is actually a fairly sophisticated egoic structure mm. in which the ego grasps and clings to labels for a sense of safety, a sense of yeah. identity, mm. a sense of a Winning. division, <laughs> us against them, yeah. uh, a false sense of security about some coming doom or judgment. So what's really interesting in the teachings of Jesus, he's, he's constantly inviting you to the love that doesn't need to cling or grasp mm. because it's been belonged the entire time. Yeah. So litmus test questions, um, questions that have a hermeneutic of suspicion in them, which is um, the, the world is sliding off a cliff and are you, I think you're part of it, or are you, it's all built, uh, it's not built around trust. Yeah. It's not built around a big buoyant sense that the whole thing is headed in some fascinating new direction. Mm. Um, oh wow, it's birthed out of mistrust or distrust in, yes, in a way. Yeah. So like uh, hermeneutic is how you read something. Right. So a hermeneutic of suspicion is, uh, and then you think about for many people for roughly 1400 years in Western culture, you've had this idea of original sin, which is that which is deepest within a human is wrong, off, broken, sinful. So no wonder people end up not able to trust their own inner knowing. They've been taught that if you look far enough inside of yourself, all you'll see is evil and darkness. Mm. But what's fascinating is the actual tradition begins Genesis 1, all human beings bear the divine image that which is deepest within you is good. Yeah. Of course you, we have tremendous capacities to make a mess of things. Nobody's fuzzy on this. But you can see often this hermeneutic of suspicion that reads, are you still, what are you, what are you, I, I need you to give me certain words mm -hmm. so that I can feel is um, rooted in a way of viewing what it means to be human, mm -hmm. that uh, you need labels and things to redeem you as opposed to you've belonged the whole time. Yeah, mm. are you on my team or are you the enemy? Yeah, is, is yeah, yeah. the yeah. underlying question quite often. So it's always funny when religious people, especially people in the Jesus tradition, their dominant energies are moving away from the very things Jesus invites us to be liberated from. 
<laughs> he you comes to liberate that, us yeah. from questions that take us in the direction we don't actually want to be going, that yeah. aren't freedom, joy, peace, nonviolence. <laughs> <laughs> I love the, uh, you talked about the story in your book of the farmer who like hired the workers and they showed up at different times during yes. the day. But they all, got they all paid, get paid the same. The same. And uh, that doesn't make any sense. You cannot divide the infinite. And there's no punch. He doesn't. And Jesus doesn't say, and here's the punchline. Right. And he just goes right. on. Right. And uh, there's also a story that you don't talk about in your book. It reminded me of the guy who like dropped everything when he found the pearl. Yeah. And I'm like, and every time I read that story, I'm like, this makes no sense to me. Like it has many different meanings, I guess. I've heard yes. it explained yes, different yes, ways. Yes. But ultimately, um, what that helped me do that part in your book is start to be comfortable with not understanding things. And you start off with the quantum physics, how, you know, there's basically chaos going on, like unexplained chaos. And then you, you know, you, there's a macro view of it of like, well, we have <laughs> unexplained chaos that goes on in the world. And, uh, and I think religion helps people find a, an answer to all that chaos. Sure. And helps them organize it. Yeah, yeah, holds it together. But the secret is, and you you talk about this with you know the Buddha and Jesus and all the priests and the monks, they got this smile on their face because yeah. they get it. They're yeah. like, yeah, there is a lot of stuff going on. Yeah, blessed is the one who's in on the joke. Yeah, uh, everybody <laughs> shows up at different times and gets paid the same amount. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, before we get into our listener tips. And our added value segment today, it looks like we have a bunch more surprise questions this week. Yes, indeed. Questions like, does Rob Bell believe in an afterlife? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> also, um, when is the best time to move on from a good situation? Mm. Plus, we've got questions about the death of God. We've got questions about whether prayer is useful. Also, questions about the problems with fundamentalism. And a million more questions for Rob Bell and The Minimalists. And if you want to hear all that, subscribe to our Maximal episodes on The Minimalist Private Podcast. It's a completely separate podcast. And it's the most honest way for The Minimalists to earn an income because we don't believe in ads. By the way, if you're not a private podcast subscriber, you are literally missing two-thirds of our show. We do this minimal episode, but then every week we have that Maximal episode. Ryan... What is a good reason? If someone who has never listened to it, and you, you, we'd want to say, you know what, try this out for three weeks, see if it's right for you. It's just two bucks. But what's the what's a compelling reason to at least try it out? Because there's only like 500 spots left. <laughs> 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 no, man. I mean, this is where we get to talk about things that we normally wouldn't talk about. So, for example, with today with Rob, we get to talk about the afterlife. We get to talk about the death of God. We, although that might have came up a little bit in the minimal episode, but there are, there are I ideas and things that we haven't quite fleshed out that we get to flesh out on these private episodes with a smaller audience. And I think Rob actually is a really good example of that today. Yes, indeed. So uh, if you want to check that out, theminimalists.com slash support. Just try it out for a few weeks. We think it'll add immense value to your life. If it doesn't, of course, just walk away from it. You can still listen to these minimal episodes whenever you'd like. But theminimalists.com slash support. When you subscribe, you'll get a personal link so that our private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. Ryan, what else you got for us? Here are some voicemail comments and tips from our listeners. Check them out. Hi, my name is Jeanette and I'm from Los Angeles. And this message is for the person that was on Beco the Becoming episode asking about what to do with religious items that she wants to get rid of, but she doesn't want to just throw in the trash. They, there are a lot of hospitals, Catholic hospitals, that have gift shops and they would probably be happy to have a donation of a cross like hers that she could donate and somebody else would be happy to have. Hi, Josh and Ryan. This is Heather from San Diego, and I have a tip for Beth. Beth asked for advice about dealing with beauty products as a minimalist. I've been able to pare down my product collection quite a lot since I started my minimalism journey about a year ago. One thing that has helped me so much is joining the Project Pan community. This is a community on the internet, you, you could just search for Project Pan on YouTube and Instagram, that makes games and challenges out of using up your makeup. Everyone is very supportive. People get really excited when they hit pan on products and eventually use them up. Doing Project Pans has taught me how long it takes to use up products and helped me to buy a lot less. Being aware of expiration dates of makeup also helps to pare down your collection. 
knowing that a foundation only has a year-long shelf life and takes about six months or more to use up will prevent you from buying or owning more than two at a time. I know Ryan mentioned the 2020 rule, which doesn't always work, especially if you uh, don't own only drugstore makeup products. Most makeup does cost more than $20. However, the 90-90 rule works pretty well for some makeup products when considering their expiration date. Remember that open tubes of mascara should be thrown out after three months. Every time you use it, more bacteria gets into the product, which is pretty dangerous considering how close the wand gets to your eye. Also, think about how you like to use makeup. Do you like to keep it simple or do you like to have choices? If you like to have choices, there are so many versatile products on the market that many people already have in their collections. Consider rotating through your eyeshadow palettes, doing a one-month, one-palette challenge to give your older palettes some love. You can do this with lip products, too. Challenge yourself to wear a different shade every day for a week. Finally, Beth, you mentioned wanting to purchase more ethically. I recommend looking into the cruelty-free movement. Cruelty-free Kitty and Logical Harmony are great resources online. Best of luck on your journey. All right, y'all. Thanks again to Rob Bell for joining us today. Check out his new book. It is the book that really we've been waiting for him to write. It's called Everything is Spiritual. I'll hold it up if you're watching on YouTube. Uh, you can check it out, audiobook, ebook, print book. It comes out today, the day this podcast comes out, September 15th, 2020. Everything is Spiritual by Rob Bell. Uh, for our added value this week, it's something else by Rob Bell since he's been here and uh, something that I got immense value from. Sean and I, podcast Sean and I, when uh, Bex was out of town and Rob was giving this talk. When was that? 2018, Sean? 2019? Early 2019, maybe? It was in the old world. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was t early 2019. And so Sean was my date for this Rob Bell event. Uh, he was practicing this talk called An Introduction to Joy, which is a phenomenal title, by the way. Uh, and he practice this talk it was great the live event was one it was like a stand-up comedy show but it was also like a uh inspirational ted talk and it was everything and none of that mm. it's hard to even label what it was although i can tell you that time just sort of faded away when we were going through it and i came out of it and i i really had some key takeaways i don't want to ruin it for you so i encourage you to check it out it's free it's on youtube it's called an introduction to joy because he took that talk all around the country and then he came back to la and filmed it uh it was andrew morgan actually directed it he was on our podcast with rob last time mm. uh, with the, the documentary he did and so it is filmed in this theater but it is hilarious you'll want to share it with your friends and family as soon as i showed it to bex she was sending it off to her parents you've got to see this and they were sending it off to other people uh, this thing is really going to take off check it out it's called an introduction to joy it's on youtube we'll put a link to that in the show notes and real quick for right here right now Here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. Ryan and I have a little side project that we talk about from time to time. It's called Minimalism Life. The website is minimalism.life. You can follow Minimalism Life on Instagram, at Minimalism Life, or on Twitter, at Minimalism on Twitter. And what, we, what we've done is we partnered with our friend Carl from Minimalissimo and our friend Alberto from Five Style, and then us, the minimalists, and also a team of writers where we... What we, what we try to share is the best of minimalist travel, the best of minimalist design. So travel's five style. Design is Carl. And How dare his website be more better than ours? <laughs> more better? <laughs> more better. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> How to write more better dot com. Um, no, and so... Uh, minimalism.life is this place where we curate the minimalist well-being, minimalist travel, minimalist uh, design, minimalist aesthetics. The Instagram account is beautiful. What we also try to do is it's not just minimalism. We're trying to add value to your life. So we have a team of writers who write there as well. You can subscribe to the newsletter. Also, Minimalism Life has published its first book. I've got an essay in there, and a bunch of other writers have an essay in there. So you can check it out. It's uh, just called Inside Minimalism. You're welcome to check that out. We'll put a link to that in the show notes, or you can just go to minimalism.life. You can check it out. What I, what I like about this side project is, Ryan, I think you and I have figured this out over the years. Whenever we work on things with people together, there's it's more difficult. You don't get there as quickly, so to speak, mm. but you accomplish something greater 
Where if you and I just started minimalism life on our own, hey, let's start a little side project. Mm. You know it wouldn't be nearly as good as what it no, is now. No, Because we do the minimalist well-being thing, but if you and I were trying to do minimalist design and uh, highlighting architecture, like we could learn about that. Yeah. But we have experts in that area that we've partnered up with. Yeah. And so what we have is this beautiful side project. Um, and within there, you can check out Inside Minimalism. You can check out the free wallpapers over there as well. Some minimalist wallpapers for your phone and desktop. Minimalism. Dot life. You can follow The Minimalists on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Minimalists. Come to one of our live podcast shows. Visit theminimalists.com slash tour to find a city near you. By the way, Rob is doing a virtual tour for his book, Everything is Spiritual. Find that at robbell.com. It's a really fascinating model. What he's doing is he's going to like a dozen cities, Cincinnati and Brooklyn and, and L.A. and uh, you know, a bunch of other places. See, uh, Seattle, but he's not going there. He's going to be in his front yard doing these events with people who he he's going to have certain people he really admires read the book, and he's going to do the event with them to sort of talk about what they got from the book. And and so this is going to happen in a bunch of different cities, but the good news is you don't have to be in Seattle to go to that Seattle stop. Or you don't have to be in Brooklyn to go to the Brooklyn stop. You can be at home. So it's coming to a computer screen near you. It actually starts the day this episode comes out. RobBell.com for details on that. You can comment on this episode at YouTube.com slash The Minimalists. If you want our show notes in your inbox, sign up for our email list over at TheMinimalists.com. You'll also receive our simple Sunday emails. And if you have a question, comment, or minimalism tip for our podcast, email a voice memo to podcast at TheMinimalists.com. And if you leave here today with one message, we hope it's this. Love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'll be fine without it